Let's do that. Make sure you at least got it. Yeah. Got it. And then we're going to report it to cloud. All right, welcome everyone uh, in the room out in YouTube land and on Zoom. It is a great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, the first speaker of the 2023 Water Wetlands and Watersheds Seminar Series. I think it's our 99th semester of this uh, <laughs> seminar series because uh, I couldn't get it together to have a 100th semester <laughs> celebration. So we're going to say that fall is the 50 year anniversary of, 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 of these seminars in this geographic location. <laughs> um, so it is uh, a great honor to actually have a graduate of this program as our first speaker of 2023. So this is uh, Dr. Daniel McLaughlin. Dr. McLaughlin has his PhD in systems ecology and ecological engineering right here from the University of Florida. He also has a master's in environmental engineering from Clemson University. He's got a bachelor's in civil engineering from Clemson University, and he didn't put it on it here, but he got an additional undergraduate degree in mathematics. So if you have any questions about complex mathematics, you can ask them to Dr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Uh, Dr. McLaughlin is, let's make sure we got our stream going, to, Megan tells me, looking good. All right, so um, he's an associate professor in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation at Virginia Tech. Welcome, y'all. I'm C. His research in, integrates hydrological and ecological processes and includes interest in watershed hydrology, forest and ecosystems, and ba basically everything eco-hydrology. So Daniel loves tromping through wetlands. You won't find him in a pair of waders. He has these old sneakers that he walks, and these are new sneakers that he has today. But he's walking through wetlands to feel the squish below his feet and try to understand how water, plants, biogeochemistry all interact to basically make wetlands work. And they work either for ecosystems uh, in their own right, for just their own value. But a lot of times he's looking at water and other water quality uh, services that wetlands provide for humans, for us, um, and tries to do that in a very analytical way while still getting out and squishing in the mud. <laughs> so with that, Daniel, I right. give you the floor. Thank you, David. Here, and you should be good to get out. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, well, yeah, this is an honor for me. And it was a big pleasure. I was just telling Matt that I think this is the first time I've been in this room since 2014. Wow. And it hasn't changed. But <laughs> I had my defense in here and several <laughs> other talks and everything else. And I've seen many of you talk in here as well. So, yeah, again, it's a big pleasure um, to be here, um, see the town, see how it has changed, how it hasn't changed. Went to the top last night, which was awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I plan on staying through Sunday. So, Trying to see the sites and supposed to be there. So this is our first semester at Virginia Tech. Day, yeah. yeah, so got recorded the lecture so they can see yeah. <laughs> um, so today I want to give just a high level look at multiple different projects, starting with projects here with colleagues here that I've kept up with um, that have motivated other projects that I'm working on now under this broad umbrella of wetland water storage, right? Um, it's distributed in landscape, particular landscapes, um, and what the and that kind of what drives that water storage, which might be kind of obvious in terms of the first order would be topography, right? But then the functions that emerge from that distributed water storage. Um, a lot of folks listed here, some are in the room. Many I could still list a lot of different places in terms of funding and collaborations. Um, and you might recognize some of those names, okay? Before I get to really the theme of today, which is about a pretty broad class of wetlands, smaller depressional wetlands that dot many landscapes, I do want to take a step back just because I'm here, and um, and I just walked by that poster that's been there for a long time. So to where I got introduced to wetlands. Um, so I can, I visited here. I think it was in February of 2004, and I was walking around. I got here a day early for the recruiting weekend, and I noticed that people were playing volleyball and didn't have any clothes on. <laughs> well, this is great. Um, and then I somehow stumbled to the center for wetlands. I've already talked to uh, Mark Brown via you know email and invited me here but he didn't offer me a project or anything and I wasn't trying to find this place I was just walk aimlessly walk around as when you know I can um, <laughs> and uh and then so well then you were in the office when it was when you had your green ceiling the office <laughs> down there um and we talked about the beautiful Bone Valley district and how that would be a great project to work on and I think about that <laughs> 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 Weather restoration. <laughs> the phosphate mining area. And I came back so excited. 
And I called my girlfriend at the time, I had a pay phone in the right community, but I didn't have a cell phone at the time. And um, you have to write this into your abstract. <laughs> and then I got back to Clemson where I was and I started emailing Wes Ingerson, who was already in the project. He's like, yeah, it's not a great place to work. <laughs> Stay at Davis Brothers Motor Lodge, which we did for four or five summers. So I can't get back to this what I want to before at least showing you how nasty that landscape can be. I think this is actually a picture from you, Mark. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but our um, goal in the larger um, what was the who funded it? Pipper. Pipper. There you go. Um, to look at wetland restoration and creation on these um, one of the post post phosphate mountain landscape elements which are placed settled areas and looking at like what's naturally occurring in tub form restoration. So we got to go out there there and I did wear waders. I didn't, didn't plan this. That's when I first wore waders. I think that was my first day in the building. I'm like, wow, we're wearing waders. It's hot as hell. <laughs> so I ditched those um and the hat because it just kept on falling off. Uh, I believe that is West Single. Uh oh. That is Wes Ingerson right there. There's his brother Lance. He helped out. We had a lot of people help out um, on that project. We met a lot of cool people. Um, and so we were looking at what's naturally occurring in terms of vegetation, the topography, the soils come back, um, and, and particularly the hydrology too. And we went down the road for hydrology even a little more. We found this general hole digger back in some shed. I think it was at the shed. And that thing was terrible. We had to get stuck. We had to have a pulley. <laughs> Anyway, trying to figure out dike seepage, which I think became one figure in my defense or my <laughs> dissertation. Um, and then where I really focused on my work was on that term, the buzzword at the time was ecohydrology and thinking about feedback of vegetation that indeed was coming in there, which was primarily willow. But all of that part of the larger project was to inform active restoration. There's Wes um, uh, bringing in some vegetation, working alongside with contractors and there's a locust tree in the foreground. I'd love to get back there and see what it looks like. I don't know if you've been back, but you know. <laughs> uh, it's so, not too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was somebody said, if you've been back there, what's going on with Fossey? But I think Sherilyn does. I have no idea. I left there to enjoy. Okay. Um, and so then I started, uh, moved on to work with Matt Cohen at SFRC, which I don't think it's called that anymore, and, um, and working on wetlands that are naturally occurring and found our way working on a particular set of wetlands, um, one of which was not where I started, but this is Big Cypress as an example, a great example of um, a landscape where you have these smaller depression of wetlands, in this case, cypress domes dotting the landscape that um, most often do not connect the uh, surface line, right? You can walk around and keep your feet dry, as we say, most of the time. Uh, but these types of wetlands exist in other regions, like the Prairie Pahl region, we can actually argue if those are truly wetlands or clustering really systems. Nonetheless, they're distributed water storage on the landscape. Uh, uh, Texas playas, west coast from pools, and now somewhat closer to home. Not really, it still takes me six hours to get there and drive across the bay. Um, what is the, that's not it, it's the middle one. Um, the bay, which is this really tall, like eight mile bridge that I don't like driving over. And this is the Delmarva Peninsula, which it took me a while to figure that was well, called the Delmarva because it has the states of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And I didn't know that until I got there, which is pretty sad. Um, but they also have distributed wetlands, a lot of agriculture and chicken farms and what have you, but still big sections of existing kind of uh, lands that where you can clearly see these, what they call their Delmarva Bays. Another low relief, depressional rich landscape. Okay. And then you, some of you have probably seen this map from Chuck Lane, another graduate from this program. He and his colleague Ellen made this map some time ago of the continental US, just looking at the distribution and density of these, if you want to call them geographically isolated, if you want to call them non flood plain wetlands, whatever, depressional wetlands that have limited surface water connectivity um, to the rest of the drainage system. And you see them dotting the Prairie Pothole region in the Midwest, Nebraska Sand Hills, West Coast, Texas Plies, even somewhat, there should be some there that are not uh, where I live now, which is about right there. And of course, a lot where we are today and through up the coastal plain. And in some of those landscapes, they can be small and look quite different, but they can be up to 30% of the landscape. So clearly there's an, some reason to want to understand what they do on that landscape there and downstream at a landscape level. Um, just because they're so present and because we've lost a lot. Putting it in a policy framework or context, I should say, it's even add motivates the work even more. So before the 2000s, uh, what is the waters of the U.S. under the Clean Water Act and what's not was somewhat questionable. There was limited guidance from the Army Corps and the EPA 
Um, until the 2000s, there were two Supreme Court case rulings, which essentially questioned and debated if tributaries that don't have perennial flow and um, are uh, wetlands that don't connect to what are otherwise waters of the U.S., navigable waters, and therefore be under federal protection, protection under the, our jurisdiction for the Clean Water Act. And what came out of that question, well, Scalia said, well, they have to have ah, <laughs> a per relatively permanent surface water connection, um, which was agreed upon. But then Kennedy, who was recently retired, came out and said, in addition, if you could see that that wetland by itself or with its buddies, right, all those cypress domes in a similarly situated area has a significant nexus to what otherwise would be considered waters of the U.S. I don't, I kind of, Think that maybe that wasn't the best choice of word, nexus, <laughs> because it connotates connection. And what he meant later on in his comments was, was that an observable um, effect on the physical, biological, or chemical integrity of down gradient or what otherwise navigable waters. And I would say effect is probably a broader term than what nexus connotates, which is more about connection. So a lot of the talks and science and conferences and papers, connectivity kind of ruled the day, okay? Um, and it motivated a lot of work. There was, there was um, a, a special uh, issue in wetlands in 2003 because what it said was, well, there was still some guidance to be had on, well, how would you demonstrate a significant nexus, the burdens on the um, regulators, and that's not an easy thing to do, right, to demonstrate that, and to inform science to inform what has become and continues to be a conversation. So one of the things that motivated was the Powell, uh, Powell Center uh, group, um, which Chuck was from again here. Chief scientist. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. there's me, but a little skinnier. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you know Mark Rains, right? Um, and That's then, the chief science officer for the state of Florida, right? Yeah. yeah, and then some people know that guy. Oh, wow. But funny yeah. here is a Laurie, Laurie Alexander, <laughs> who was a lead on the connectivity. And that guy in the very front is Scott Leibowitz, who graduated. That's right. Yeah, we can't forget <laughs> Scott, right? So, um, yeah, a great group. We ended up meeting, what, three, four times? And Fort Collins, which is not a bad place. They give you bikes. I think I had Elder Leopold's bike and we had to go to breweries and everything and doing the court and stepping on. Did you work? Oh, <laughs> and, uh, and stepping a lot of goose shit because there's a lot of geese around this place. Yeah. Yeah, we did some work. We did a lot of work. Um, and we're just not us, but a lot of the list of papers on this subject goes on and on and on. And they were subject to a review by that connectivity report with Laurie Alexander, who was a, a good friend um, who, who led that report which then became the precursor to the Clean Water Rule and the Obama administration, which never was enforced. It was immediately stayed in the courts and the political pendulum swung. And then Trump uh, revoked that and set up his own rule, which is NWPR, which I never can remember. Is it Navigable Waters Protection mm -hmm. Rule or mm -hmm. National Nav Nav Navigable Nav Waters? And what that did was pretty much default back to Scalia, whereas the Clean Water Rule categorically extended the jurisdiction to wetlands with some adjacency and clarified these groups of special wetlands that you would um, that you would address for significant, significant nexus. So that was revoked, and his well, this administration well, it was more about Scalia saying you had to have a permanent surface water connection or relatively permanent, which of course ditched the uh, the GIWs and those types of wetlands, whatever they call them, as well as like ephemeral channels, right, that are in the headwaters of a lot of catchments and most catchments, including my backyard. But then this uh, holiday break, right, this December 31st, the Biden administration revoked Trump's rule, which really never played out, and went back to Obama's clean water rule, more or less. And I'm sure that this will keep on going this way which is unfortunate. But nonetheless, one motivation, not all motivation, to understand these systems. They're important landscape elements on their own. Okay. So that's what I want to talk about today is just give you, again, just kind of a, a broad sweep of the type of work that we collectively have been doing on this topic. Thinking about distributed water storage, I mean, I think that's one of the names of the, you know, really one of the things that these little wetlands do by, de by definition, right? Limited surface water connectivity probably means they're increasing the sponginess of the landscape. 
And that can mean something at local scales for functions, but of course, when you have a lot of them, landscape functions. And I want to kind of do it in three threads. One is the clear one, hydrologic functions, um, but also what it might mean for bio biogeochemistry, carbon specifically, some new work there, and uh, by Oda, which have had actually some fun playing with critters, not really for me playing with them, but anyway. All right, so we'll start with hydrologic functions. I'm not going to talk about Coca-Cola and specific yield, uh, <laughs> but just nonetheless, uh, you imagine these wetlands dotting the landscape. They they take in water, groundwater flow, surface water flow. This is pretty limited. They might lose a lot this way, and they might return some of that water. Um, and so we wanted to, Matt and I and others, wanted to ask the question, in addition to some other topics related to that project, which I'm not going to go over, um, this kind of groundwater exchange deal. Um, and... What we found when we were in the field, and this is a dated figure, sure, clearly, but it tells a story, right? So down here is just one wetland here, two groundwater wells around it. There's actually three. Um, and then the dark blue on the time series on your left, or excuse me, right, is the water level in that wetland, that surface water well. And these light lines are the elevation, right? This dashed line relative to that dark blue line. And you can see over time it goes around it, meaning that sometimes the groundwater around it's lower and sometimes it's higher. And you can kind of mark that with dry periods of time and wet periods of time. And we can calculate those flows in different ways. Um, but the point is that they switch in terms of that wetland receiving water, particularly during wet times, and then re-releasing that water, particularly during dry times. So we saw that in the field and we said, all right, well, that's pretty cool. What does it mean? And we can see what it might mean at local scales, but we wanted to think about what it meant at landscape scales and why this is occurring. And that's where I would talk about specific yield and all that, but I won't just for the sake of today. The point is because wetlands are less sensitive to precipitation events. The water level doesn't go up as much with that same precipitation event in the upland because the upland soils have displacement from soil particles, right? Whereas the same thing goes on with that for transpiration. You're going to lose that water pretty much that right depth of, let's say, five millimeters of evapotranspiration, but that five millimeters in the upland might make a much bigger drop in the water table because essentially you're taking water out of a cup with ice, right? Mm -hmm. I'd say it once. Okay. So the point is, uplands are more sensitive, wetlands are less sensitive, and that switches hydrologic gradients where they can have the sink function during wet events and source function during dry events. And the question is, is well, this guy's doing it, this individual's doing it, they, they're doing it, right? At that scale, but if you have all that perimeter for exchange across the landscape, what does it mean for the ups and downs of the water level below this landscape, right? And of course, it's the ups and downs of that regional water table that influences downstream base flows in our streams. And so we had to bring David Kaplan in on this question just to, to uh, ask this question, with our conce uh, model conceptualized, but very much process-based, where we're representing each individual wetland and it's back and forth with groundwater, to say, let's put a lot of those wetlands on, small, a lot of bigger wetlands, or maybe just one big wetland, and, ma and manipulate area of wetlands, density of wetlands, a lot of small wetlands, a few big wetlands, manipulate climate, manipulate soils, all in a generic landscape, a fake landscape. Right? That's what our landscape looks like. Um, and we did a bunch with it, but for now, this is it on it, where we have a certain potential of evapotranspiration, of a particular uh, mean annual precipitation if we model those things, and so on and so forth. But for this particular climate, which is somewhat near where we are, um, we can manipulate wetland number on this axis, wetland area on this axis. So right here, we have a lot of wetland area spread across a lot of little wetlands, right? And right here, we have a lot of wetland area spread across two wetlands. And our y-axis response variable is the change in base flow variation. And you see that they're negative, particularly this thing starts sloping down when we get a lot of little wetlands, meaning that we've reduced the ups and downs of base flow that comes out of that landscape by up to 30%. So an indirect and that water may never make it from that wetland to that stream, but it's the back and forth, these wetlands acting like capacitors is what we like to call them. And one key point is that if we take this same wetland area, but distribute it over one big wetland, we lose this function, it goes back to zero. 
And that might speak to mitigation and taking a bunch of little wetland functions and putting them in, in the corner of the landscape. But that might be a conversation for another day. Okay, more recently, back to that beautiful image of Big Cypress on the ground measures. We're working with Matt and the colleagues. We've done, we did a lot of stuff on uh, testing a hypothesis about how these wetlands actually came to be and their patterning. But one of the things that we did was we monitored how often they would connect um, via surface water. And indeed, they do, even though most times, or a lot of times, you can keep your feet dry, and what that actually means for downstream base flow. And so if this little squiggly line goes up, that means a lot more wetlands are connected. You can splash between them, and as they do in synchrony, you see that that creates pretty episodic flow downstream gauges. So again, both models to look at this question from a subsurface perspective, empirical observations to think about it, and surface water connectivity and what that might mean for downstream waters. Uh, moving to the prairie pothole, asking the same question, but at a bigger landscape and with a different model. Uh, Chuck Lane, Heather Goldman, their um, postdoc, who then became my postdoc, Greg, uh, Greg Evanson, working on a refined SWAT model. Some of you probably heard of the SWAT model, it's just a model out there uh, where you can represent different landscape elements. And he worked to more explicitly represent individual wetlands as their own kind of HRU or own kind of model component. And we could play games again about putting GIWs or these prairie potholes in, taking them out, and see what they do for stream flow. Storage capacity also clearly holds water back into the landscape with large watershed, right? And more residence time, we can definitely think about what residence time, how long that water sits there in terms of what that might mean for carbon processing, nutrient removal, sediment removal, and so on. And that, which is a nice segue to think about some more recent work, more explicitly on connecting now into this biogeochemical thread, uh, the hydrologic effects from that water storage and carbon cycling. So this is some work that I was lucky enough to um, continue working with Nate Jones, who was a postdoc with me and became a postdoc with Margaret Palmer at UMD. And now he's faculty at the University of Alabama, colleagues of mine at Virginia Tech, uh, Aaron Hotchkiss and Darrell Scott. Um, and there's a great group to work with, and we're continuing to work on the fourth year of the project. And we had a lot of questions and hypotheses, and now we're back in the Delmarva Peninsula and Delmarva Bays. Uh, we can barely see it right here on this inset, but what I'm trying to call attention to here is all of these wetlands, right, where Nate, with really good topographic LIDAR data, was able to calculate potential storage capacity. Some wetlands have a lot more storage capacity than others. And we had some hypotheses of what that meant for CO2 emissions, methane emissions, um, DOC processing, dissolved organic carbon, and export of dissolved, dissolved organic carbon, as well as dissolved inorganic carbon out of this thing. But right now we're thinking about just individual wetlands. We put a bunch of sensors out there. <clears throat> uh, we have dissolved oxygen sensors distributed across our wetlands, uh, FDOM or dissolved organic matter, we have CO2 sensors, which now they don't make anymore, and that's another story. Um, uh, clearly pressure transducers to measure groundwater and water levels um, and emission chambers um, and a lot going on there. And we, we have a four of students on the project. <clears throat> One of which is my student, Nick. This is kind of hot off the press. I'm sorry for uh, his units or the labels there. It's hard to see, so I'll just tell you what they are. This is Epdom, just dissolved organic carbon kind of I know that's not necessarily one to one. Um, and then this is water level. This is James Mays, not Nick Coraline, who is the best technician you could ever have, um, who was nice enough to move out to the Eastern shore and live out in the middle of nowhere so that he would be close to the field sites because these sensors require a lot of TLC. So he does them like every 10 days. Um, and he recently now is going to graduate school, which is good for him and bad for us. Um, so that was the thing that would float you know, on this kind of um, teeth post so that it would always stay 10 centimeters relative to the top of the water, right? If we fixed it, sometimes it'd dry out, or sometimes if you tell me it's on the bottom of the water, top of the water the system. So this wetland, I'm, he's calling a perennial wetland. The point is it never dries out. So this is, just think about this kind of dissolved carbon concentration kind of versus stage. This wetland never dries out, but more importantly, I probably should have had some figures in here to explain this. 
but its bathymetry or its topography is like that. Really steep slopes, <clears throat> like almost like a cylinder. It's meaning that when it dries down or when it wets up, it gets deep, pretty deep, over a meter, chest deep in, one, in some places, but you don't get much more flooded area, right? Because of that steep slope, a little bit of water level change isn't gonna inundate that much more soil, right? And we see that as that happens, we get a dilution effect, which is might be um, predictable, right? Because you're just getting more water to dilute the source of that dissolved carbon, which is from litter breakdown and extractable from the soils. Whereas this wetland does dry down, of course we don't have concentration when it's dry, so it's still zero there, um, but its bathymetry is more like this. So when that water level goes up and down, it inundates a lot more area. And what I want Nick to do is to convert this stage to flooded area using some topographic data and he just hasn't got there. But my guess is that our guess is that that might be an explanatory factor because that dilution effect is obscured as that thing gets wetter because it's flooding, you know, organic rich soils much more because it's within the tree. So something about a local topography, even these two wetlands are uh, 50 meters apart, but they're quite different and how they generate DOC wherever it goes or the fuel's emission can be different. But I also wanna do this at the landscape scale, right? So there's a lot of these little wetlands across our landscape. They connect as Matt likes to call them like a string of pearls, right? Where there's a lot of these little wetlands and you could at times kind of splash your way through these little intermittent or ephemeral channels. And we had some predictions about how the catchment water storage, the cumulative storage of all these little wetlands at that catchment or watershed scale influences things like as you increase that, you should probably have less surface water export. You should probably have more inundation or flooding. You should probably have more residence time. And it probably could do something to the variability of those things. And we then say, well, what does that mean for carbon? Because these things relate to how available carbon is. When we predicted that if you hold the water back, that stuff gets more processed, less bioavailable. Export, we predicted, might have some kind of intermediate effect where we don't have any storage capacity. You don't hold water back long enough to generate DOC, right? And if you have a lot of storage capacity, well, you never export. So maybe some sweet spot. And then in terms of exported DOC, we had some predictions there. Again, I'm not going to go into the findings because this works ongoing, but just to kind of give you an idea how we're trying to connect things we know about hydrology, how topography influences those things, as well as other drivers and what that might mean for carbon dynamics at local and landscape scales. Um, and from the export perspective, here is one of those channels exporting from our string of pearls. And we have also sensors there. Here is kind of, I should switch this because somebody put it north, but I still want to think about it as a watershed here, our headwater wetlands, right? And they kind of connect at times. We have a mixing bowl we call, we have all kinds of different names, and then eventually it comes out <clears throat> after it connects with this individual wetland. And they all look different. Some have, have a lot more emergence. So there is a plant component we're exploring, uh, exploring too. Some are just very dense in terms of their surrounding canopy, so no aquatic vegetation. And so there's some questions there, but we do have CO2 and FDOM sensors here measuring X4 when it happens to, again, put it all together and ask questions, and this is a lot, but is this the way we're thinking about things? We're trying to look at gradients and water storage at wetland scales and at wetland scape scales. We're making hydrologic measurements, modeling, a lot of carbon measurements to try to think about the outcomes for carbon, get some metrics from hydrology, so we can ask our questions and test our hypotheses. But again, I don't have these findings that this work is ongoing. Now, <laughs> I'm going to use this as a segue, and it's maybe an aside, but Nick, my student who's supposed to be doing this, it was, had got his master's in practice as a community ecologist for some time. And so I can't get him away from the critters. And so when he was walking out there in the wetlands, he noticed this, a huge, huge map covering one of those wetland surfaces, of um, wood frog tadpoles. And so this might seem like an aside, but I'm going to use it as a segue, but also I don't think it is. Like it's that water storage that made it attractive, attractive for these frogs to lay their eggs. 
where there's limited connectivity for waters with dish predators. It's a good refuge, it's a good place to set down your eggs and let these things do their thing and become frogs to do it again next time. So it's this distributed wetland sources across this landscape that is supporting this population. That's the biological, that's obviously an effect of biota. But I'm gonna stick with it here around carbon because that could be an indirect effect. And this is what um, um, Nick had proposed is that these guys have to be doing something to, to change carbon dynamics. They're directly munching on the litter for sure, right? But there's also, they're excreting nutrients. And so there's all literature in other fields and um, Chris Dunn, I think is here, right? He, he does it in thinking about consumer nutrient or consumer mediated nutrient dynamics, where if you get a place that's attractive to consumers, be it a hippo or a tadpole, well, they do things there and they can change the topography like hippos, right? But they can poop a lot and they can excrete a lot and that might stimulate and alter the microbial activity. So he got excited about that and he had some field studies. He measured the excretions of these tadpoles. I had to go through IACOP training, which I had never done before, which wasn't fun. He set up mesocosm down in the field with where he would have tadpoles and where he wouldn't. Um, and this, again, he just gave me kind of a first draft. I don't think it's close enough to even call it that, but he did give me some figures. And what he measured was excretion rates. Here are tadpoles as they get bigger over time because he measured excretion over time. And here are nutrients, right? Ammonia, phosphate, total phosphorus and total dissolved nitrogen. And I don't know that the trend with tadpole weight is all that important. The point is they're excreting some stuff, right? Both in the nitrogen and phosphorus. What I guess might be somewhat interesting is the phosphorus excretion rate per gram of tadpoles increasing. So as you get bigger, clearly you're gonna excrete more tadpole, more tadpole, more phosphorus, <laughs> right? But you're actually doing even more per body weight than you would have when you're small. But the point is they're excreting stuff, which is not all that surprising. Um, and is irrelevant as the next question, right? Does it have an effect? And so one thing he did was he went out and measured um, extracellular enzymes, microbial enzymes, things they put out to help them do their things. I'm only showing two here, the ones that had an effect. Like obviously the controls in blue and um, whatever orange color that is, is the treatments where we have the tadpoles. Both of these enzymes, which I can't, pronounce them or know what they are. The point is they're related to nitrogen acquisition. If these are elevated in the water, that means the microbes are excreting these enzymes to help them go out and harvest more nitrogen because they might have a limitation of nitrogen. And in the first part of the study, there wasn't much difference of this dissolved enzyme in the water. But then with time, right, you can clearly see that the treatment where there's tadpoles was reduced in this nitrogen harvesting enzyme, suggesting coupled with this, where they're putting out some nitrogen in addition to phosphorus, we're putting out some nitrogen, maybe that nitrogen limitation was alleviated and they didn't need to, um, to put out that enzyme to harvest more. So again, is that relevant? So then the next thing he did, or in concert, I guess I should say, was he put out mesh bag uh, litter bags where you actually pack it full of litter, and you have a mesh or fine mesh one, which you don't like or don't let things like tadpoles in. So they're not allowed to directly munch on the litter. And then you have cores. So the one thing that's happened in this microbial degradation, whereas you have cores and that allows both things to happen. Um, some of you may know that our guest that maple is going to have more de decomposition than oak. But particularly with the maple, and a significant, our power is limited, and that's an issue that we're discussing. There are powers limited in terms of sample size, but even with that limited power, we have a significant increase of the dry mass loss in the fine mesh of the oak, or excuse me, of the maple. And that pattern kind of holds for course, but this is what I want to emphasize because remember, the tadpoles aren't allowed too much on the stuff, but their presence and the excretion of those, nu or those nutrients might be stimulating microbial activity and stimulating decomposition. All right, so I said that's still related to water storage and water you know, biogeochemistry, but uh, I'm using it also as a segue into biota, which is the last of the grids. And I might be cheating a little bit here, but I want to do something close to home in the mountains where I live now. So there are these bog wetlands that are seepage wetlands that are either kind of distant, so maybe we can consider these geographically isolated, 
They might be the initiation of the drainage system or that stream, but sometimes they're next to the stream. Then they're not bogs. I don't know why people call them bogs. They're mineral rich soils, but nonetheless, they call them bogs and they're groundwater seeds. And they support bog turtles, which again, probably shouldn't be called bog turtles, but that sounds better than mineral turtles. Okay. <laughs> um, and I never heard of them. I had to look them up. They're federally endangered. Um, because of habitat loss, apparently they make really, really good pets. People like them as pets, so people always farm some good pets. And I had already had an existing collaboration with Carol Haas and Wildlife on an Eglin Air Force project, which I'm going to come back to. And she said, well, we've been working on this, working on this, but it turns out hydrology probably matters. And it does because they like constant saturated soils for their hibernicula and other kind of needs. Um, and so I uh, have a master student working out there where we've instrumented beyond just this well. We've put in a lot of wells in a lot of different places. Um, beautiful areas, again, right off the Blue Ridge Parkway. Not as, not as nice as the Bone Valley District, but it works. Um, and we put multiple wells. And what's crazy is it's not that big. I probably put a, uh, uh, a scale here, because we put five wells out in probably the area of two of these rooms. And I was expecting some water table equilibration. And one place, water level is always like this, right at ground surface. Uh, three meters over there, all over the place. And it was just crazy that that not that much equilibration, meaning that the hydrology is quite complex. Because I came in there thinking, well, if we want to make spatial maps of hydrology, it's the water table in one place and put some typographic data out there and we can spread the water out. But in this case, and so the, what came clear was these seeps, these discrete groundwater seeps where the water comes up is quite important for that habitat area. Right. And so across six to eight sites, that's what we're doing, multiple wells, but we're also using ways to map those seeps and the seep habitat. So sorry, I'm a legend. This is temperature, temperature map. So this is Ryan Wall, my student with a high precision thermometer, always going certain depth below the soil surface, recording temperature and also specific inductance, which the map looks the same. And the cool spots, is even this in the summer, are where ground waves popping up, right? And some probably not saturated habitat in the middle. And you can see these two seeps here that he just walked. So always wet, always wet, where there's um, based on vegetation, just him always out there um, because these seeps keep it constantly, constantly wet, even during the driest time is when he walked and made this map. Different time he used this to make kind of a distribution of that habitat area. And he also put telemetry things on glued them on those small turtles and map where they go. And so we're working now to try to align those things um, to kind of inform conservation. Um, so the drivers of this, we're trying to figure out as well, like landscape position, depth of bedrocks, and so that we can kind of zoom out and think about those landscape scales so we can maybe identify what would be good bog habitat where people aren't looking, bog turtle habitat, I should say. Um, and so that's the point of that. And the driver of that is this topographic groundwater setting, right? Um, and you can look at the hill slope, which you don't have here, but you can look at the hill slopes there and probably guess where that water is going to pop out. Um, but there's other drivers of water storage and what it might mean for biota. And so I'll pull this in um, that David has worked on quite a bit in wetlands, and David and Matt and I have worked on in uplands to think about upland management, right? So here's our wetland. This is a vernal pool in southwest Virginia which I was lucky enough to stop by and get a bunch of country ham afterwards. Here is a very dense pine forest, this relic from industry um, owned by, I believe, TNC that needs some thinning. A lot of straws in the upland, which connects to this wetland subsurface. We've already kind of talked about that. So is there something you can do outside of the wetland, managing this upland, to do something for this wetland? In this case, water levels and how much water, right? Because we take the straws out of the upland where there's probably less of that transpiration, maybe more water to hydrate this wetland. And in this particular wetland in Southwest Virginia, when we walk around, we found one of these eggs, which is a maybe salamander egg, which is a buzz listed, I think at the state level, not federally, but they also need the timing of that water storage to do their thing that might be affected from upland activities. So David and I, with some others, we link together some models we worked on with Matt and say, we can, hey, it's all about the upland honey trees you have crises. That says something about the water use or the evapotranspiration of upland. Well, then our model to connect upland groundwater and wetland water sitting here. And then we said, well, we can get that using a 
greenhouse gas emissions going back there, but also habitat suitability. We know something about when a mole salamander or a leopard frog or flatwood salamanders, how many periods of wet periods of time do they need to have their potential development? It was a thought experiment. It's probably not right. Maybe not even the direction of it's probably right, but the idea is there that we defend is there is some connection across these things. And then I know David and his students have taken it forward um, in terms of different treatments. And to that same point, and now here appears that flatwood salamander, which is another federally listed species that is occurs in large part at Eglin Air Force Base, not too far from here, Panhandle. Um, and working again with Carol Haas, I mentioned her name, her student, Houston Chandler, um, back, this is soon after I got to um, Virginia Tech, looking at water level data that they have distributed across the wetlands, thinking about the timing of the ups and downs of water level and what habitat it inundates and what that means because the, this, these time periods to go from egg to larva and larva to metamorphosis, that these guys are finicky. No wonder they're endangered. They need really specific cues and timings and habitat. They need it to be inundated to do this thing, and they like this type of habitat, not canopy. So this is informing, or they're interested in, now things to do within the wetland, because these things have been uh, um, fire excluded for quite some time, but those are naturally more herbaceous, embedded, depressional wetlands in that flat, flatwoods landscape. We've continued on this project, but at a bigger scale, where now we're using topographic data, across the place, right? And with that topographic data, we can zoom in on wet and wetland here and look at highs and low areas, right? The high areas are orange and the low areas are the blue, right? And then we can build staged area curves with that information, right? So if I were 30 centimeters, we know how much of the, how many hectares are flooded and then we go up 50 centimeters and we can do that. And then if we indeed have a water level device recording water level every 15 minutes in that said wetland, well, now we can map flooded area over time and put gray bars when those are key times for development of that species. But to extend that beyond where we can instrument with wells, um, we still have all this topographic data, right? And so we can still kind of do this even where we don't have wells. Think about places which might be suitable or not from a hydrologic perspective in terms of their flooded area, as well as use it to get us something about vegetation, right? LIDAR are the first returns. Um, I can remember when Mark Brown said this in, I don't know, 2004, he said, they just kept on throwing all that information away. And, and it's useful, and it is. And it can give you something about canopy structure. And again, they like these species like low stature herbaceous. And so trying to find areas where we have estimated good hydrologic suitability, but also so suitable vegetation across this landscape to identify what might be um, potential wetlands for um, relocation <laughs> and the introduction of species, because that's what they do. Um, they reintroduce so, and that's um, and we And that's in review right now. Uh, so I'll end with, what time is it? We got seven minutes. Nice. I'll end with, well, I hope, I mean, I would imagine most of us before we walked in, think of various different ways that holding water back in a wetland probably matters, right? But what I was trying to give you today is some things that I'm doing and we're doing in that context, and also the tools um, that you can use to determine the extent to the effect of that on certain functions and quantify that. And also to inform largely conservation, restoration, and all that kind of stuff where we have a loss of this water storage. This is in Delmarva, a ditch draining a wetland. Um, you can see what used to be in Delmarva Bay and the ditches, removing it. That was a five acre wetland probably, um, five hectares, excuse me. And it's not just in Delmarva, it's here, it's everywhere. You can clearly see these ditches here and what used to be Delmarva Bays probably. Um, and with that, you're actually increasing connectivity. Right, and you're decreasing storage capacity, the ability of this landscape, well, in this case, to even be a weapon, but to hold water back for these functions, presumably related to storage capacity. Um, this was a cartoon that Chuck Lang had contracted out when we were doing this work. I don't know if I like it or not. Either way, he says, hey, this is how much water you can hold back if you have a ditch, and this is how much you have if you don't. 
Um, and we'll call that potential storage capacity. So then this is work that Nate Jones did while he was with me. Again, using very good LIDAR data, you can see the ditches here. Here's one particular little wetland catchment or watershed, if you will. Um, and then you can zoom in and he, with that individual wetland, you can say, this is how much water you can hold before these ditches connect out and it spills out. But if we didn't have those ditches and we plugged them, this is how much the system would hold before it spilled out of its rim like it naturally would. And so using that across the Delmarva Peninsula, hundreds of thousands of wetlands, identifying where there were ditches and where there weren't, and if you had restored them, what would be the storage capacity gained, or you can flip it and think about what it used to be and what was lost. He did that across Delmarva, um, aggregate to the 10 level up leave here. Um, we can see landscape storage and a distribution of that. Um, hard to see with this color, I never really liked it, but the unit or the numbers show you if you spread it out over the landscape, order magnitude higher. Uh, to make it clear, we can just look at percent change, where there was a lot of wetlands ditched and what we would get back if we clearly were not going to store all of Delmar Peninsula, but maybe a tool to identify where it may, makes most sense and where it doesn't. And to build on that, then we enter, take this model back that we started with. Here is the swap model I alluded to that Gray was working on the prairie pothole that represented individual wetlands better, but did not represent subsurface exchange. And so we took that this kind of version of this model and embedded it in the wetland landscape element for exchange along the spillage down to our reach. And we did this for the Greensboro watershed, which I'm highlighting here. And what was quite cool about this, I thought, was that we calibrate the model not just with stream flow, but we also calibrate it with time series of inundation from remotely sensed data, Landsat, to say we want to get it where it's right on both ends, so meaning that we could get the right answer for stream flow, but not represent <coughs> flooded area very well in reverse. And we wanted both to happen. So I thought that was a pretty cool thing. And then we got to play with it. And this is still in prep, and it's been in prep for, I think, five years now. Um, and I don't know that it's going to go anywhere, but it was a nice place to end this talk, I think, with <laughs> colorful pictures, to show you the tool, like, hey, we know this information, right? We have a calibrated model. We can now say, well, what if we did this restoration in Greensboro? What would be the change in certain things that we've already talked about today? One of which would be you get a lot more flooding. Um, some, you actually get less, right? Because maybe you plug the ditch that was upstream from that particular wetland that where it was receiving water. But on the whole, you get a wetter landscape, which is not a surprise, but nonetheless, the tool that someone could use to more target and optimize efforts where it might make most sense for other reasons. So you get a big change and the same thing goes with residence time. I will end there with this these take homes and take questions if I have time. All right. All right, awesome. I'll check the YouTube and the Zoom, but we'll start with questions from the room. I've got an observation. Go ahead. 50 years ago, we worked with HTO on the wetland landscape, Zephyr's Domes, and Pine Flatwoods. And Odin kept saying, wetlands save water. <coughs> and so I spent a lot of time, as you know, showing that. Hmm. That transpiration doesn't do it. Well, it's cute, but it doesn't do it. You have vindicated next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Maggie. Um, we'll go to Pietra. I was just <clears throat> with the graph that you had with the perennial and semi perennial. I was just hoping if you could just like fully okay. explain yeah. that because I I heard you talking and then it started yeah. like yeah, it was a lot of people really, really <laughs> probably fast. Um, so this is dissolved organic matter. So yeah. how black the water is. Like you've been on so you're from the area? Like yeah. have you paddled black water rivers before? Like on the Santa Fe, Santa Fe Swanee, Fe, like tea yeah, colored yeah, right. water. So yeah. That's not sediment, that's dissolved color from tannic acids and fulvic acid and all these organic molecules, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're generated largely in wet systems um, and the export of that to those streams. Um, and so this was just looking at some some measure of that indicator, um, a lot of caveats, and then water level, meaning that one wetland, the concentration goes down as it gets wetter, but 
another weapon does it, and we can explain that based off the shape of his weapon. So, yeah. We'll go to Pietro and then we can come. Sorry to bring you back to the frogs, but I was curious like, do you think it'd be possible so the pebble grew up to be the frogs, they've taken in all these nutrients, and then maybe they leave and go to another weapon? Yeah. Do you think that could contribute to any loss? In Sure. I mean, that's getting to the concept of like a meta ecosystem, right? And and transfer stuff across patches because of consumer movement in this case, I'm sure. Yeah. And this is from a work I'm trying, he's trying to publish this as is. I'm trying to get him to take a couple of steps. But we'll see. Honestly, I wonder how this affects their disease rates. That's putting it in that's putting, that's putting the kitty pools from all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like when they're this dense. Yeah, yeah, and the minerals, the 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 types of um, wetlands that they're in, and the ones that they choose, whether the minerals that are found in their specific ones, and the quantities of that affects their like. Yeah, I don't know. That's out of the scope of our question, but I was thinking about it yesterday. I was walking around Sweetwater Branch, uh, treating the weather, and thinking about those things. If that was a trap or not. <laughs> yeah, so here and then to Dr. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you. When you said you measured extracellular enzyme activity, what was the method? That yeah, I'm not it. It's <laughs> <laughs> beyond the scope of your <laughs> I can I can uh, link you up with my PhD student who's done it and gone through some trials and tribulations to make it right. It's not it's not necessarily easy. Oh, because a part of it would have some information to what I would be doing with nonlinear kinetics. Sure, I'm happy to, and he's done research and, and stepped through some hurdles. So, jump over. Um, so yeah, I can like so you can just contact me. Yeah. But I Thank don't, you. I don't have any idea. What's Thank you. No, go ahead. It's the same perennial uh, that Mikey was asking about. So, one of the things that has been shown, like maybe consistently in sort of catchment studies, is that the concentration of DOM in the stream increases with discharge uniformly. Yep. And the explanation and also the mean concentration increases with wetland density. Mm -hmm. So those both of those mm -hmm. things, I think like they're, you know, nothing in science is locked down, but I'm going to call those a given. I get that. Yeah. yeah. And so this suggests the opposite effect that you should see dilution of stream DOM as the wetlands become connected because they're producing, storing less and so what's the explanation? But can also, you draw the cross section just real quick? But they're also not exporting when they're high. Unless it's subsurface. Because you've got this wetland over here, and, and so you've got this is your area where you're creating your DOM, right? Mm -hmm. We're at chalk top of it, but then the other wetland is like this, right? Yeah, so your stage is just yeah. getting more and more participation. Right, I mean, that's what you're saying. And we have, a, we, not me, uh, Scotty has a student who is actually measuring extractable organic matter going in this down from, but to your point, I think it's maybe, well, if it was just isolated weapons, then I would suggest it might be like ah, that. Right? You have to have the connections to have the export, but if you're really wet, you are having that dilution effect across the land. Has, has that ever been observed? No, I don't because, think yeah, because I think you have floodplains well. They're also probably generated through this. Right. But it's not just the pathetry of the wetland, right? It's also the connectivity to the landscape of the running <laughs> event. So where you have the dilution, it may make sense that it really is isolated from running, and you're really just getting atmospheric input, and the DOC is just coming from the sediment underneath it. Whereas other wetlands, including this pathetry one, you may have a, a catchment area around it that you're getting, you know, runoff through. Our, 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 our it's inundating more area. But, and this one's more connected than this one is. Right, but you could have a shape like that, but still have a contributing area during the rain event that's still dragging quite a bit of DOC in. So yeah, it's not just the pathetry mm -hmm. of the wetland, it's also the connectivity to the watershed. Sure, and I would say that the pathetry of the wetland probably indicates its, its potential connectivity to the right. watershed. Right. So it's not twofold, like you have this wetland that it generates more DOC, but probably is more often connected. And is that, I mean, is so that, that very with like recession rates? Does the cylindrical one has got a slower recession rate? And yeah, hmm. it does. All right, we'll do one more and we'll let you go. Of course, if you have to run to class, please do. One more question from the group. I know I hear it. I hear Dr. Well, yeah, yeah. But if you're registered, make sure you sign up. <laughs> yeah. And on one of the two sheets. <laughs> 
All right, well then let's give Dr. McLaughlin one round of applause. We'll see you all next week. A couple of the people that he showed in his slides are presenting this uh, this this semester, either in person or virtually. So we get to see the the whole crew. All right, thanks, folks. <laughs>